rise up this morning. That's us. Amen. We're rising up to give him praise, to give him thanks, to give him honor because he deserves it. There's a lot of people out there that say a lot of things about who they think they are, who they think we are as a church, who they think you are as a person. But y'all, none of that matters. Why? Because I am who he says I am. I am redeemed. I am free. And in my Father's house, there's a place for me. Hallelujah. We are chosen this morning. We are not forsaken this morning. He is for us, not against us this morning. I am who you say I am.
this morning. Yes, I am. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that there's a place waiting for us with you to spend eternity with you. We love you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for the pain of the resurrection. Thank you, Jesus, Jesus.
and I don't feel your work yet. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Do you feel the liberty in this place today? I'm going to tell you something out there in Facebook world. I want to. I just want to say thank you for allowing us to visit you in your home, and I pray right now the presence of God we feel in this place. Come right through that camera, right into your home, because the presence of God is here. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. I tell you, he is here. He's got a word for us today. I am excited about what the Lord is doing, because no matter what it looks like, he's working. Can I get an amen? Well, what we're going to do this morning is, Listen, this is normally a time when we'd be taking up an offering, and I just want to say thank you for all of you that have supported the church through this trying time. All of you out there that are giving online, it has been a very humbling experience uh, to see the faithfulness of God's people and, of course, Him working through you. The church is not lacking for anything. I think if we could just throw the doors wide open, I think we're going to find out we've actually grown in this time. And... Uh, So if you want to give online today, there should be a link right there on the Facebook page where your 
where you're looking and people keep telling me how easy it is to do so. For those of us that are in the sanctuary, just whenever you feel comfortable during service, there's a basket right back there in the back and you can just get up, go present your offering uh, to the Lord. But before we do, before we actually release everybody to do that, I want to talk to you for just a moment about what this weekend. And, and you know, sometimes you want to use the word celebrate so much, but I think the word observe is better. You know, and I can tell you this, you know, our chief master sergeant, uh, Bill Estes, he's retired now. Uh, he always brings this out about what Memorial Day is not. Memorial Day is not about the barbecue, although we should thank God for the freedom to have barbecue. Memorial Day is not about furniture sales and mattress sales. I don't know how many of them is going on right now anyway. But it's not even about thanking our veterans who we do appreciate so much. It's not about thanking all of our first responders, which we appreciate so much. It's about remembering those who paid the ultimate price, who showed the greatest love. For Jesus said there is no greater love than when a man lays down his life for his friends. And there are people who have gone on before us who have given their lives so that we can have the freedom to come into this place and worship today. And we're going to talk about a little bit more about this in the word that God's given me today. But Memorial Day should speak especially loud right now because there's a lot of encroachments upon our freedom. I've noticed that it seems like when that every nation and people go through a cycle that we can become spoiled. We forget the price that's been paid for our freedoms. And when that happens, people are more likely to give them up. So much easier. And I tell you what, we should never take freedom for granted. And we should never take the people who gave their lives for us to have it for granted, ever. Ever. And so I want to pray. After I pray, Valerie's going to come. She's got a... Uh, just a powerful, powerful message and song for us today considering Memorial Day weekend and so forth. And while that's going on, you feel at liberty to go and, and drop your offering if you are ready to worship the Lord in that way today. For the Bible says that where your treasure is, your heart is. But let me pray. Dear Father in heaven, Lord God, as we come before you today, I feel the freedom in this place. Your word tells us that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. And I feel it in this place today. God, I just want to thank you for the people that you have called. And not only into our military, but the people who have actually made that tremendous sacrifice. I pray for their families right now. Lord God, that people have gone on and given that ultimate sacrifice. And I pray that you just wrap your arms around those families of those people right now. But Lord, I pray that you impart into us a fresh appreciation for our freedom today. Leading to a fresh appreciation of the people who gave their lives in the military to make sure that we could come into your house today unfettered. That we could come into your house today and worship. That we have the freedoms that we enjoy. And, of course, we come to you in the name of the only one who's ever made any of that possible. That is, in the name of your precious son, Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Make Valerie feel welcome as she comes forward.
On Memorial Day, we remember the price that was paid in the battles that were fought and the lives that were lost to gain our political freedom for America. But an even greater battle took place. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ fought against the powers of sin and death by dying on the cross to give freedom to those who believe in him. As he died, he fulfilled the requirements of the law and became the perfect sacrifice, freeing us from its sin and the dominion of sin over us. And now we are called to walk in that freedom and live by the Spirit of God. Well, I'm going to tell you, that was very well done, Valerie. And the message was so, to me, so in balance and so powerful. I mean, I'm talking about appreciation for those who have given their lives for our freedom, yet all glory goes to God. Amen? I mean, that was really well done. That was an amazing song for Memorial Day. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, I tell you what, God's given me a word today, and, and I've just been... So grateful to God for the way that he's been leading us through this time. The way that all of you have handled this time together. Um, it's just, you know, you could just see God in all of it. You know, when this first began, we um, started with a message, you know, there's a whole lot of shaking going on. And, you know, that comes from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 27 through 28, when it talks about how God, you know, he, when he shakes things, is so that the things which are made can be removed. In other words, those things made by man can be removed so that the things that are grounded in the kingdom that cannot be shaken may remain. It's kind of like weeding out a garden. That's going to speak to you in a little while. But it's kind of like weeding out a garden, and we see that happening. You know, I started with talking about how schools, you know, that we took prayer out of school in 1963. We've been taking God out of our education We've been taking God out of our schools. And when this shaking came, the schools had to shut down. But then you see people like Philip and Amanda and the way that they homeschool their children, wanting them to have a good Christian education, and they're not shaking. You know, you talk about uh, Chick-fil-A. You know, all the restaurants had to shut down and go to takeout. What was the one restaurant chain better prepared for takeout than any other restaurant chain? That's Chick-fil-A, two and three lane drive throughs People already already trained to take orders out in the parking lot. Well, talking about schools, I was looking uh, at the news and they were showing diagrams of how they want to remodel schools because they're trying to figure out how to have school. They're even questioning whether they're going to even start school back in August now. And what they're doing is instead of a typical classroom, they're showing desks around the walls so that you're pointed toward a wall so you're not breathing on anyone else with shields in between them. I want to show you a picture of our classrooms. Can you show me a picture of our classrooms? Will you look at that? That's our classrooms. We already have a shield between every child. That's part of the accelerated Christian education. They've been doing it since the 70s. Our rooms are already set up exactly like they're going to have to remodel the school. Show the next picture. Did you show both of them? Man, can you believe that? And look, that's just another example of God going before you. Now, we're going to have to remodel all these brand new... They're going to have to remodel this brand new school they're not even finished with right down here at Osborne. And the whole time, there we are, ready to go back to school. Already prepared. God already got it planned. And I got news for you. I promise you, people are going to be looking for some smaller schools for their kids to go to. Some places where they can get that personal contact but yet be safe. I mean, I'm just telling you, God's gone before us. You know, God told us, told us this, you know, I was, I'm a task-oriented person, and, and, you know, I just felt like we need to be doing more and needing to be doing more, and God says, don't miss it, be still. Just be still and, and know that I'm God. See, God quietens things down so that you can hear Him. Remember the example of Elijah? He wasn't in the earthquake, he wasn't in the fire, he wasn't in the wind, he was in that still, small voice. 
You know, I know I'm always talking about this because you just always need to get this in your spirit that God, when he created everything, he did it in such a way so we can understand the spiritual. So you look at the natural to understand the spiritual. And, and, and the seismologist said that the entire earth had quieted down. That the entire earth, now seismologists could hear movements in the earth they couldn't hear before because of the lack of noise that people made. That it was the quietest that they've ever seen except for on Christmas Day. I thought that was pretty amazing. That God quieted the whole world down as much as he does on the day that we give observance to the birth of Jesus Christ. And you know, be still and know that I'm God. And I hope some of you took advantage of that. I know I certainly have, and God has been speaking to me so much. I'm like, Lord, how do I even put it all together to share with people? How can I even articulate what you're showing me so that we can understand what's going on and what we need to be doing? I mean, I'm talking about, I got so much information, I don't know what to do all of it. God has been speaking, and if you've been quiet and if you've been listening, let me tell you something, he speaks to all of us if we will just listen. Amen? And then we did, don't miss it, repent. See, and a lot of times when God speaks, it's so that you will repent. God doesn't speak as often to say, hey, you're doing great, keep going. No, he opens that door, he works miracles as you go along. Usually when he speaks, is to point out something you need to correct. Read the prophecies, for example. Most prophets were raised up not to say, hey, you're doing great, but to show people where they were getting off track. And so when God calms things down and makes things still, very often it's going to be time of correction uh, to, for you to get back on track so that you'll be ready for what's coming next. Because to everything there is a season. Amen? We talked about last week, what time is it? And we talked a little bit about looking at, at creation to understand that, that time is a creation. Time began when God set things in motion. That as things begin to move, that is what time is. It's, it's the progression of movement. And whenever you understand that there's a season for everything, remember when you get to the fourth day of creation, God divides the night from the day, and he gives a brighter light to rule the day and a lesser light to rule the night. But he says that he did that for signs, say signs, seasons and years. Signs point to seasons so that you'll know where you are. Time, in the fact that God, when he set everything in motion, he didn't make it start running in a straight line. He made everything go in cycles so that you can, I can understand spiritual things. That that which is has already been, and that which is going to be has already been. See, Sunday's already happened before. And if you've been here before, you knew a little bit more about what to expect when you got here. Now, if this is your first time here, then you're probably a little confused trying to figure out what door to come in. Amen? But when you go through things over and over, you're better prepared. That's why God made everything cyclical. Okay? Right, well, all that in mind, when we were, listen, let me, let me do this. When we, when we talk about end times, when we talk about last days, people get a little confused. And it can get a little confusing. For example, when Pentecost was poured out, God said, I will pour out my spirit in the last days. We've been in the last days. The church is in the last days. But then there's also an end of an age, which I don't think we're going to get to today. But if we don't, we're going to get to it next week. But there's also an end of an age. Well, what is an age? It's a season within a time. And the church age would be an example of an age. When does that end? It ends with the rapture of the church. God turns his attention back to the Jews. Immediately after that, out of that chaos, somewhere, I don't think it's going to take long because when chaos comes, have you ever noticed how people turn to look for answers from man? All you got to do is have a charismatic leader and he don't have to be charismatic because of God's anointing. The devil anoints people too. You have a charismatic leader raise up and everybody looks to him for answers. When he signs a peace treaty with Israel, that's when the tribulation starts. There's seven years of tribulation. Then Jesus comes back. There's judgment that takes place, the judgment of the nations. Then he sets up his kingdom and we go in the millennial reign. What we talked about last week is we can see the stage being set for the time of tribulation. Okay? So that means we're very close to the rapture. In other words, if we can see the stage being set, you don't set a stage till it's time for the curtain go up. If you can see that being set, then you know you're particularly close to anything between you and that. Can I get an amen? amen. That's what time it is. But what I want to talk to you about today is what is it time to do? And God spoke to me and said, it's time to work. It's time to work while it is still day. Let's pray. 
Dear Father in heaven, Lord God, I just want to thank you and praise you for your word. I want to thank you, God, that you do not leave your children in the dark. That, Father God, while your kingdom is like a treasure hid in a field, well, Lord, just as we leave our treasure to our children, we know you've left it to us. That, Father God, that you've given us maps, you've given us calendars, you've given us times, you've given us seasons so that we don't have to wander in the dark, God, that we can see a wisdom from your point of view. And so, God, we need that kind of revelation knowledge today. Lord, I just ask you to open our hearts and our minds to receive the truth of your word. I'm asking you to send the truth teacher, the Holy Spirit of God, whether it's right into people's living rooms, whether it's into this sanctuary, whether it's with our youth that are broadcasting live right now on Zoom, whether it's our adventures of faith, uh, Father God, that's being broadcast, wherever it may be. I pray, God, that you just send that truth teacher, enlighten us, help us to grasp what you have to say today. And we will be sure to give you all the honor, praise, and glory. For it is in the name of your precious son, Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. So it's time to work while it's still day. Now, let me tell you what I'm not saying. Kind of like Memorial Day, amen. What I'm not saying is you go running out there and start hugging everybody that you don't know. Okay, you don't, listen, love is considered to one another. You don't go running out there, start hugging on all kinds of seniors that might be more accept, susceptible to disease. You don't do that because you might be carrying something. You walk, the Bible says those who walk wisely will be delivered. God doesn't say every dumb thing you do, he'll rescue you from. He says he, we who walk wisely will be delivered. You know what that means? It means look circumspectly, pay attention to what's going on around you. Amen. Also, man, let me tell you something. I love freedom, and we need to give each other freedom. If you feel like you need to wear a mask, wear a mask. Maybe there's a reason God is leading you to wear a mask. Let me tell you something. If God, what, Whatever God is leading people to do at this time, whether it's churches, whether it's businesses, we need, to give, we need to be praying for all leaders, and we need to give them the freedom to do so. That's what freedom is all about. We're all working our way through this thing, okay? All I want to hear from God Take all that noise out from out there, Lord, and show us what we're to do as a body here. How are we to walk through this time? All right, with that being said, John 9, verses 1 through 2. Here's Jesus. He's walking along, and it says, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. So it's not a man who could see, and then something happened to his eyes, or he had cataracts, or something like that. Here is a man who, in his childhood, never developed eyes. Okay? And it says, the disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, I'm going to tell you something. I've been asked that question a lot in different ways from people during this time. That this sickness of COVID has come upon us. People are saying, is this God's judgment? You know, is God mad at us? You know, is, you, listen, here's the thing. It will get very confusing, even as you read scripture, if you try to figure out exactly who's doing what. Okay, you know, when God calls Nebuchadnezzar his servant, that's hard to figure out. He's actually a shadow and a type of the Antichrist. But yet he's God's servant, right? Here's what we need to know. Whatever the devil means for evil, God can use for good. And there's a war going on, amen? And what our question always should be, what is God up to? That's our question. Where is that light shining, amen? All right, not who sinned, who did. We know that all sickness ultimately came into the world through sin, but it doesn't mean that every time someone does, is sick that they did something wrong. Amen? There's sickness in the world. And so Jesus answers and he says this, which is puzzling. All right, verses 3 through 4. Jesus answered and said, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works, say works, of God should be revealed in him. And you're like, what? Now, did God allow this child to be blind so the works of God could be revealed in him? Well, whether he did that in the beginning or whether God's about to use it, but I can tell you this, anytime God puts you through anything and you, and you make it through that test refined, because that's what he means to do, he never leads you through tribulation for no reason. He never drags you through the valley to be mean to you. Everything he sends us through should refine us and make us better. Amen? And there's always a reward after Always, when Job went through his time of testing and trial, he was given twice everything he had before. Twice the children, twice the love, twice the joy, twice the belongings, twice of everything. God rewards people who go through these things. Okay? 
But he's saying that this right here is happening right now, that God's works could be revealed in him. Now look at this. Here's what he says. I must work, say work, the works of him who sent me. How many of you know the church is a called out people, a sent people, okay, while it is day. While it is day. While there's that parcel of time for me to work, I need to be about God's business. Why? Because the night is coming when no one can work. Now, when we looked at that story of creation, where there's a brighter light to rule the day and a lesser light to rule the night, there's some things that you can learn because what? We know that in Jesus was the life and the life is the light of men. We know that in Scripture that you can look at the natural light to understand good. You can look at the, the, the example of, of darkness to understand evil. And thank goodness, light is more powerful than darkness. That means good is more powerful than evil, folks. That's why the Bible says don't try to overcome evil with evil. Overcome evil with good. It's more powerful. God is more powerful than the devil. But we talked about this last week, that, that the only way this room can become darker because light is more powerful is if you turn down the light. You cannot turn up the darkness to make this room darker. It doesn't have the power. But all you have to do is turn down the light, and it's the nature of the darkness to just come right in. And I'm going to tell you something. If you haven't seen that happening, then you need to take a little closer look at some of the things that are going on. Churches have been closed down. I'm talking about drug programs have been closed down. I'm, talk, I'm going to be talking to them this week. We're about to get that thing going again. Listen, if we have to use social distancing, we got a gymnasium. We had 100 drug addicts coming here at a time on Friday nights, and now they're trying to do small groups, but it just isn't the same. Okay? So what's happening right now, this was just on the news Friday, there, the request to go into drug rehabs is up 380%. 380%. When you turn the light down, the darkness comes in. Okay? When God allows us to go through things like this, it very often reveals what's going on in the world. It reveals what's going on in us. Who do we really trust? Who do we really look to for answers? You know, do we have a spirit of fear? Or a spirit of power of love and a sound mind. You know what? You know, it reveals things in us. And I was watching some things on the news. Now, our governor here in Georgia decided to go ahead and start loosening up, received all kinds of criticism. But actually, the COVID has been trending down ever since he did it. Now, I'm not saying it's trending down because he opened up. What I'm saying is he opened up because of good news. And the good news is progressing. Right now, as of this week, all hospitalizations are down 38% in Georgia. But yesterday on the news, they said their hospitalizations are down all across the nation. Everywhere. But yet, in the middle of that good news, some things are being revealed. Like, for example, the governor of California, the governor of Washington State, the governor of Illinois, the governor of Missouri, and many other governors are showing their true colors. Why are they doing that? Because now, I want you to get this. In those states, they have decided that now they want to open up their bars and you can have 50 people in a bar, but you can only have 10 people in a church meeting. Now, come on now. I want you, just, I want you to let that sink in for just a moment. Let's forget about God. Let's say we're all lost. We don't know God. Don't even believe there is a God. That doesn't make sense. When you walk into a bar, I'm going to sit at a table that someone else just sat at. Right? Maybe they cleaned it. Maybe they didn't. I don't know, All right, but you're trusting them to do that. But when I sit at a table, I'm going to be sitting across from someone, breathing towards them. Most of the time when people go out, they like other people to come with them, so maybe there's people that haven't even been habitating together, and they're all sitting around a table. And they got food in front of them they are all breathing towards. You know, from the very beginning, they were, it was warned that alcohol makes you more susceptible to the COVID virus. Why? Because when alcohol goes into your body, your body begins to fight that. It's, it's a foreign substance. It's a poison to your body. It's trying to get it out of the liver. It's, so you are more susceptible to COVID. So it doesn't make sense that you use that and then say a church can't have but 10 people. Why? Because when you come in a church, we got the doors propped open today. I'm talking about when you came in here, no one has sat in your seat in seven days. Okay, so they even said in the beginning 
Uh, now get this, in the beginning they said that COVID would last from a few hours up to five days on the surface. The CDC came out with a report this week that maybe it's not, it doesn't really live on surfaces that long. But in that article, somehow they brought it back to the church. In that article, they started talking about the danger of churches. I'm thinking, man, you'd think the only place the COVID virus attends is church. Never talk about it in Home Depot. They never talk about it in grocery stores. They never talk about how many people may have caught it in bars in the beginning. How did the, how did the CDC pick that one example and pull out? Okay, but the fact is, no one sat in your seat in seven days. As a matter of fact, because we're creatures of habit, if you were here last week, you were probably the one who sat in it seven days ago. None of you are looking face-to-face breathing on each other. You're all looking towards me with every other row empty. Okay? It doesn't make sense. We're not serving food. We're not serving drink. It doesn't make sense. It's darkness taking advantage of a light being down. Now let's bring God into the situation. Oh, I'm looking for a drink today, but I drink from a different fountain. I'm talking about I want a drink of that living water. I want a drink of that living water where no disease can exist. I'm talking about we're here, and Jesus promised when two or more of us are gathered, he's in our midst. That includes you out there in, in, the, in Facebook. And I'm talking about God is there in your midst, and by his stripes we were healed. So don't tell me that there's not something going on there. It makes no sense. It makes no sense. They said suicide hotlines are being overwhelmed. They're looking for help. I saw a a special where in Alpharetta, and Alpharetta is a very low crime part of our city. So the, the, the police stations are overflowed because of domestic violence. So they're not prepared for a lot of crime. And because people are in their homes and now they're being shaken, if that home, listen, how many of you know it's hard enough when you've got your house built on a rock? (laughs) Take a bunch of lost people and and make them stay at home and see what happens. See, and I got news for you. You know we were created to work. Genesis 2.15 says God created man and placed him in a garden to tend and keep it. Now there's a difference between work and labor. We'll get into that in a minute. But you take people out of that environment and put them home, they don't have Jesus and all they got some of that alcohol, you're going to have trouble. But let me tell you something. And you know I don't get into politics, but if you can't rejoice with what our president did this week, there's something wrong. I, I'm sitting there listening to him speaking the same thing I said in my first sermon. President Trump goes, how is it that you got your liquor stores open you got your you got your pot stores open. You want to make sure your abortion clinics are open. Now you're going to open your bars and you're not opening your churches. It's not right, and I will step in. So immediately on the news, he can't do that. He doesn't have the authority to do that. He says, what I do have the authority to do is save all those pastors their court fees. And he says, what we'll do is we'll have the Justice Department start taking those states to court for violating their First Amendment rights. Now, if you're a Christian and you can't celebrate when any leader of a nation does that, you you might want to take a look at that. Okay, because we should all be rejoicing in that. I don't care who they are. Amen? But let me tell you something, and I quote, I quote, thinking about what we've been talking about, he said this. He said, now is a time when our country needs more prayer, not less prayer. Now, you know what he's saying? Now is when we need to turn up the light, not turn it down. Oh, yes, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. So when when Jesus does this work, everyone gets upset. Not everyone, certainly not the blind man. But people in the temple, the church, the Pharisees, they all get upset. And you know why they get upset? Because they think Jesus is working when he shouldn't be working. So you're not supposed to work right now. As a matter of fact, in John 19, 9, 9, 16, it says this. 
after he heals the blind man and everybody's seen it and it's been confirmed that this guy was born blind all that. It says, therefore, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. In other words, he's working when he should not be working. He's supposed to be over there doing other things. And then others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? See, it was a sign of the time. Remember when John the Baptist said, are you the one that we're looking for or should we look for another? Remember what Jesus said? He said, tell them the signs that the lame are walking, the blind is seeing, the, the, the lepers are being healed. He gave them signs. He says, how can a sinner do such signs? So there was a division among them. And see, that, that's exactly what happens when God shows up. When God shows up, if we're not careful, we'll start becoming divided. At Pentecost, what happened? People are being filled with the Holy Ghost. They're speaking in tongues. And you got other people saying, oh, they're just a bunch of drunks. Remember what Peter said? Oh, they're drunk, but not like you suppose. <laughs> Woo, I'm looking to get drunk in here today. I can feel it coming on. All right, I'm talking about, man, we just celebrated uh, Palm Sunday. What happened is Jesus is riding in. People are praising God. They're laying their clothes before him. But then you got other religious leaders over here going, No, Jesus, tell them to be quiet. They shouldn't be doing that. You know, Herod was coming in the other side of the city. Watch out, the government might get us. Come on now. Okay, I mean, that's exactly what was taking place. So division comes, amen? But let's not let that happen to us, people. Everybody needs to give the freedom to each other. You know, I was thinking about 2 Thessalonians 2.7, and it says this, that the lawlessness is already at work. You could say darkness is already working. But he who now is restrained, the light now restrains the darkness until he is taken out of the way. And when he's taken out of the way, then the lawless one will be revealed. All you have to do is turn that light down for that lawlessness to come in on us. And I'm telling you, it's time to turn our light up. It's time to turn it up. All right. Now, let me give you some good news, <laughs> okay? Talking about the kingdom of God. You know, last week, this picture I showed you last week. Can I have that picture up there again? That's been speaking to me all day long. That's why God, when he created the natural, he did it so we can understand the spiritual. That has been speaking to me all day long. Every picture is worth a thousand. Okay. Pictures speak to us. And remember last week, the parable of the mustard seed. Jesus said the, the, the kingdom of God, if you want to know that kingdom you can't see and learn about it, look at the mustard seed. It is the least of all seeds. If you've ever seen a mustard seed, it's a little bitty. And it says, but yet it grows to be the largest herb. In other words, it's, most herbs don't grow into trees. Not only does it bear fruit, but it even provides a place for God's creation to live. The birds live in its, in its limbs and so forth. But here's a picture of when that little seed found a little crack. Now here's where I want to get to this week, what God's been showing me. See, very often in the very environment that you would think God would not want to work is where he works. And it's actually in that environment where the greatest work is done. See, if that had just been a tree, we'd just be looking at a tree. But I'm telling you, that speaks to me about the kingdom of God. What does it tell me? That seed had a plan just like God has a plan. And it couldn't be hindered. It couldn't be restrained. I'm talking about it grew and it burst that rock. But let me tell you this. Let's say a windstorm came right now. And you had a whole field of mustard trees. Tell me the tree that would be best prepared for a windstorm right now would be that tree. Why? Because it grew and it expanded in an environment that says no. In an environment that tried to restrain it, it grew in that environment and so it's stronger, it's better prepared. If a flood came, I'm talking about that tree's better prepared than any other tree for a flood to come. There's an adversity principle in life. Okay, that whenever you're tested, whenever you're tried, if you let God do that work in you, you're going to come out stronger. You know the old saying, it'll either make you or break you. And you can see it in all of God's creation. You take a lion. A lion is the king of the jungle, right? You know why? He's on the top of the food chain. A lion's trying to eat everybody. Nobody's trying to eat him. Amen? But if you take that lion out of the jungle and put him down here at Atlanta Zoo and throw him a piece of meat every day at 5 o'clock, He'll get fat, he'll get lazy, and he'll get weak. 
If you threw him back out in the jungle, he wouldn't last a day. Well, I got news for you. Sometimes, well, I'm not going to say sometimes, just about all the time. Matter of fact, remember what Jesus said, it's more difficult for a rich man to go through into the kingdom of God than it is for a camel to go through an eye of a needle. But with God, all things are possible. So it doesn't mean that you can't be done. But the fact is, most of us, when we really get comfortable, we get lackadaisical. When we really get comfortable, we get to where we start taking things for granted. And I'm talking about, it's the same thing. You ever met a spoiled brat? Someone who's given them everything. I'm talking about just like that, he'll get upset. Can't handle anything. Miserable. Nobody likes them. Isn't it something to think that if God answered every prayer that you pray exactly the way you wanted it, you'd probably be spoiled, nobody would like you, and you wouldn't be happy. The fact is there's an adversity principle, and we see God's kingdom working in it, and I believe that's exactly where we are today, folks. That we have an opportunity to work in an environment where God can really show himself. I'll get down to that work, but I want to give you another example. Speaking of John the Baptist, amen? So John the Baptist is called to do a special work, and he's called into an environment that you wouldn't think he'd be called into. In Matthew 11, 7 through 8, it says this. As they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, speaking of John the Baptist, What did you go out into the wilderness to see? What did you go out there to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. Well, I can tell you the answer to that one. If you were looking for soft things, you didn't go see John the Baptist. I mean, the guy's out there wearing camel hair and leather and got locust legs hanging out his teeth. I mean, he's out there eating locusts and wild honey, man. There's nothing soft about this guy, right? Verse 9 through 10, Jesus said this, But what did you go out to see? Why did you go out to the wilderness? You know, that's actually the word desert. If you look at it, it's the same place where Israel crossed the Jordan River and came into Jericho. So we know about where he was in the Jordan River, and it is desert. Okay? What did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, and I say to you, more than a prophet. Why was he more than a prophet? Well, he tells us. For this is of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face. So prophets come with a message. But John had more than a message. He had a job to do. He had a work to do. So he was more than a prophet. See, behold, I send my messenger before your faith. He's got a word, which was what? Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Can I tell you, repent right now because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We can say the same thing. But it says, who will prepare your way before you? In other words, he was a prophet with a message and a job to do. He was to prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. And that's exactly what time it is for all of us. But what is the work? And I'm going to tell you, I think we're going to be looking at a lot of things over the next few weeks. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know. I just God takes me through these things right along with y'all. But I can tell you that I'm going to start doing some things. I'm changing our mindset. I'm going to start talking about soul changers. If we need to spread everybody out six feet apart and use the whole gym, that's fine. I'm going to be talking to Amanda. I wouldn't ever tell Amanda what to do. Man, that's why I hired Amanda as our children's pastor. If you could see passion, when that woman talks about children's ministry, it would be coming out every pore of her body. I'm not kidding. Go ahead. You can give the Lord a hand clap of appreciation. From the time I first met Amanda, I said, Lord, you know what would really be fun? Is just give her everything she needs and cut her loose. I tried to do it where we were before, but the time wasn't right. Well, we've done it here, and she hasn't disappointed. Amen? But we're going to start talking about, about what do we need, what signs do we need before we really feel comfortable bringing our children in here, knowing that our children don't understand social distancing. Amen? You know, what is going to be that sign when we can really gather together as a church and celebrate? You know, I've been praying for Father's Day. It's been been suggested to me to wait till till, till, uh, July 4th, but I can't make a decision now. We're walking through this together. But here's the good news. I was actually making decisions day by day. Now I feel like we can make decisions week by week. See, it's lightening up, amen? 
Okay, so we're going to start looking those ways. But there is a work that all of us are called to do right now. And I'm going to show you why I think God has everything prepared for this work for every one of us. Once again, let's go back to the natural to understand the spiritual. So first you had Adam and Eve. Yes, Adam is created to work. He is created. He's placed in a garden to tend and keep it. Well, Adam and Eve chose to go their own way. They disobeyed God and the fall of man has happened. And there's consequences any time you turn away from God. And so God is speaking those circumstances, those consequences. Let me put it that way. Consequences, and he's actually pronouncing a curse. And I want to show you this curse. It's found, it's found in Genesis 3.17. It says, Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife. See, we've got to pay attention to whose voice we heed. Okay, we won't, listen, Paul says, and I'm not, look at all these wives and husbands laughing. I'm not just talking about y'all. <laughs> ah, I'm talking about all voices, amen. I'm talking about you got to make sure you're putting the voice of the Lord first, right? Paul says, I do all I can to maintain peace with man and God, but God comes first, you know. But anyway, he says, he heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree which I commanded you saying. In other words, I told you to do one thing, you listen to someone else. You shall not eat of it. All right, for this reason, cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil, say toil, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. See, that's, that's labor. That's the difference between working and labor. Okay, working is a good thing, man. When you're working and the gifts of the Spirit are operating in your life, it's a joy. It's a joy to work when you're, when you're given the freedom to operate in the gifts that God has given you. When you're trying to operate out of those gifts and you're trying to do something that you're not called to do, you get very frustrated. It becomes labor. Amen? But now I want you to see this. Verse 18 and 19, he carries on with this curse. But both thorns, say thorns. Okay. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth, speaking of the earth. And you shall eat the herb of the field in the sweat of your face. You're not just going to be out there tending and keeping what I got growing. You're going to be working. You're going to be laboring to make these things grow. You shall eat the herb of the field and the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread until you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For dust you are and dust you shall return. Now I want us to focus on what is going to hinder him. What is going to turn his work, his tending into labor. Thorns. Okay. Now let's take it to something we can see. That explains the spiritual. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus gives us the parable of the sower. And in the parable of the sower is very important. We've gone through it before. God may call us to go through it again because Jesus said this. If you don't understand the parable of the sower, how are you going to understand any parable? So it's a key to unlocking parables. Okay, In the parable of the sower, also in the parable of the wheat and tares, also in Corinthians... The, 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 the field is the world. The world is God's field. Can I get an amen? amen? And he gives the example of sowing seed, and he tells you just flat out, the word is the seed. And so when you go out here and you sow the word, there's certain things that hinder it. Sometimes it lands on stony ground and it can't take root. There's people whose hearts are hardened to God. You, you might as well be talking to a rock and speak to them about God. Doesn't mean God can't crush it up, soften it up, but some folks are really hard. Then he says that sometimes when you sow seed, the ground is just shallow. And so it actually takes root, but there's not enough root in it for it to remain. And, and the enemy comes and he snatches away the, the seed off the rock. Some of it doesn't remain because it doesn't have root. Listen, it can happen to people. The enemy come like a bird and snatch away that seed. I, I think it happens very often in healing. People can come to an altar and you pray for healing and man, you're healed. And then you go home and you look at the medicine and you listen to the TV and you look at the doctor's report and the next thing you know, the enemy snatches that healing right away from you. Okay? But then he talks about this one. And I think that I know that this is something that God has been up to. Amen? Here's what it says in Matthew 13, 22 through 23. Now he who receives seed among the thorns, say thorns, is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Now let me tell you something. I love it when the economy is going strong. I love it when money is flowing. I love it. But can I tell you, 
it has a tendency to choke the word. When everything's going strong and all the kids are involved in sports, what was happening? People weren't in church. They were down here at the Little League baseball field. Not today. Okay? Nothing wrong with Little League baseball. What's wrong is when you start putting things in the wrong place. You know, one of the things that amazed me about going to Jerusalem is that when we were there on the Temple Mount, did you know there was a place for them to exchange money and to sell sacrifices? It was perfectly acceptable. What happened was they got out of their place. See, there was a place because you came in from other nations. You want to come worship? You could change your money. If you were a poor person and you had to walk many, 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 many miles, you could come in, you could buy a sacrifice. But you know what happened? They wanted to start moving their tables closer and closer to the temple. They started moving things that should have been in the outside in the court of the Gentiles right into the holy place. Kind of like in a flea market having the best location. And when they entered into the place, that's when Jesus went in there and cleansed that temple. It wasn't what they were doing, it was where they were doing it and how they were doing it. Nothing wrong with sports. But if it takes the place of church, my friend, you're putting it in the wrong place. Come on now. And that goes for all things. Nothing wrong with going to a movie, but when you start compromising yourself and going into movies that trash your spirit, that is not good. Shut down, okay? So what, and listen, deceitfulness of riches, I'm going to tell you something. I think a lot of people have been shown just how dependable riches are right now. I'm talking about some folks are losing some money. You know, Delta Airlines, love Delta. Here in, here in, here in Atlanta, fly Delta all the time, got my Sky Miles, all that kind of stuff. But I didn't even know they started supporting all kinds of things that were against God. Now, you know how much the airline industry is losing right now? $100 billion a day. See, riches come and riches go. Amen? I'm talking about, man. All right, so what does that mean? You know, let me tell you what I believe it means. God's got this field weeded for us. He's removed some of the deceitfulness of riches. When people understand they can't always depend on that 401k for everything that just took a big hit. Now, I want everybody to have a good retirement plan. But you better be dependent on God. Okay? Whenever you take that deceitfulness out, when you start understanding that maybe some of these things that we're doing, they're not wrong in themselves, but we're starting to give them the place instead of God. When people get, you know, the average person, then a millennial goes to church 14 times a year. 14 times a year. Studies have been done. Well, I'm talking about sometimes when you can't go to church, you start appreciating going to church. Amen? So I'm talking about, so God has been weeding this. You know what it's like? It's like God's pulled out all the thorns. He's pulled out all the thorns. I think he's breaking up some rocky hearts. I'm talking about people are open to be talking about the Word of God. People are open to be talking about what God is doing. People are wanting to know what in the world is going on. They recognize it's not natural. They recognize it's supernatural. God has been preparing the field, folks. It's time to work. It's time to sow seed. It's time to call that person that you witnessed to the last time that wasn't receptive because maybe, just maybe, all the thorns are out of the way. Maybe all the rocks have been undone. Maybe that ground is exactly where Jesus goes. He says this, But he who receives seed on good ground is he who hears the word, understands it, who, he, who indeed bears fruit and produces, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. I believe God has been preparing the ground, church, and every one of us can sow that seed whether it's on our jobs, whether it's speaking encouragement, but bringing it back to the gospel. So let me just share it with you right now. Can I just tell you, if you're out there listening to me and you're going through some stuff and you don't know what's going on, God's got it. But the question is, has he got you? Has he got you? Because let me tell you something. This is Memorial Day. When we show our appreciation for those who died so we could have freedom, but just as Valerie sang a minute ago, the greatest sacrifice ever made was on the cross. Where Jesus Christ died in your place. And I'm talking about right now, you can just stop and receive his word. Receive that seed down in your heart. And say, God forgive me for not giving you the proper place in my life. And I'm going to change that. I'm going to repent right now. I can feel that the kingdom of God is near. And so I'm going to repent of some things. And I ask you to forgive me and to come into my life. 
And I got news for you. It's not about obeying a bunch of rules. It's about a living God sowing a living seed in your life. And within that seed, there's a plan, just like the plan in that tree. And I'm talking about I don't care how bad you've messed up. I don't care how broke you are. I don't care whether you got a job or not a job. That seed has a plan for you. And if you'll receive it right now in good ground, remember what it say? To the earth we return because the earth we came. You can receive that seed in the spiritual. And I'm telling you, God will grow something in your life. And not all the powers of hell, not the gates of Hades, not no financial situation. I know I, nothing can stop God's kingdom from expanding in your life. And it's right there for the asking. It's right there for the asking. Tina, I'm not going to be able to finish my message today. We're going to start on it next week. I want you to go to the last slide. Come on up, worship team. Come on up. Come on up. Don't get discouraged because I'm not finished. I'm telling you, i got so much. We've gone for weeks. Okay. But I think it's a good place to stop. One good thing. Come out of here with one good seed. And that one good seed is this right here. Have you taken advantage of the stillness to hear his voice? If not, be still today because he's got something to say. Is there anything that you need to repent of that you haven't yet? You need to go ahead and repent and get right with him because it's time to go back to work. Are you so focused upon the riches of the world that maybe you've lost that you're having a hard time hearing a God? Let me tell you something. There's only one time when God says, test me and see if I'm real. That's why we need to be considerate of one another in this time. You don't go out and just start acting foolish and jeopardizing your health any more than I'd ever tell you to run out here in the middle of the highway and say, watch God save me. There's only one time when God says, you want to test me? You don't test me by running out in the highway and see if I'll save you. He says, you test me with your tithe. That's the only time he gives us permission to do that. And right now is a great time to do that. It would be like running out in the highway. If you're broke right now, when, God, when next time you receive finances, you give 10% to God and you watch what God does. You watch what God does because he gives you permission. You want to test him? That's where you test him. God's got a plan. Last slide. We're going to close with this. You are the light of the world. Why could Jesus say that? Because in him was life and he is the light and that life is the light of the world. And if he lives in you, now you're the light of the world. And you've got a job to do. A city that is set on, set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket. But on a lampstand and gives light to all that are in the house. See, that's, that's our job. We're to give light to all in the house. Anybody we have influence over. And right now, as I said, I believe God may have some hearts prepared that were not prepared before. You might want to go back and check that. But here's what he says. Let your light so shine. Say so shine. Let our light so shine that when men see our good works, that they tell us thank you? No, they might. I mean, grateful hearts, love God loves that. No, when we do good works, we do it in such a way so they understand it's not us. It's not us. It's God doing those works. That when men see your good works, they will glorify your Father in heaven. And just as I said, God picks very unlikely environments in which to work to gain glory. He took John the Baptist. You would think that if you came to prepare everybody for God, wouldn't you go to the temple? Wouldn't you be in the temple telling everybody to get ready for God? Wouldn't you go to the palaces so you could tell all the kings to get ready for God? No. He took them out in the wilderness in a dry environment. But you know what he put in that environment? A river called Jordan. In the middle of the desert, there was a river where people could be baptized. See, right in the middle of that environment, God moved. You wouldn't think you'd, you'd never choose to plant a seed in that rock we looked at. But in that rock, God showed his power. I got news for you. In this time when darkness is trying to come in, let's turn up our light. Let's turn up our light because I got news for you. We serve a working God and he's always working. Now, we haven't been doing altar calls as we usually have. I've been staying around. Anybody that wants prayer, wants prayer. Now, I had a family that tells me that they have a, uh, uh, the patriarch of the family is facing heart surgery. And so, if they're comfortable to come on down, they're going to come on down and we're going to have the elders lay hands on them. And I'm only saying that because they asked me for this. Okay? Everybody's got to follow what you feel like you need to do. If you need prayer, just be considerate of one another. 
If you're a prayer partner and you feel comfortable coming, only if you feel comfortable, we're going to pray for this family if they so decide to come up here for prayer. But we're about to open up this altar and you can pray right where you are. If God is speaking to you today, let's talk back. Let's talk back. That doesn't sound good, does it? That sounds like something irreverent. Let's answer what he's saying to you.
Well, I believe God just did a healing. And I believe God just sowed a seed. Sowed a seed in good soil. Amen. I now bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. May your days be free from fear. May you be blessed with the spirit of power, of love, and a sound mind all the days of your life. As a deer panteth for the water, so may your soul long for him. I ask you right now, God, to bring the pictures of people into our mind where you have gone before, prepared the soil. Show us, Lord, where we need to be sowing seed in this special time that you've prepared your field. Lord, I pray that you bless everything these people touch that brings glory to your name. I pray, God, right now that you bless them with the power and the courage to let their light shine, that when men see their good works, they'll glorify you in heaven. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And all God's people said, Amen.